On behalf of the Texas Program in Sports and Media and Cappy McGar, uh, welcome to the annual Frank DeFord Lecture on Sports Journalism presented by the McGar Symposium on Sports and Society. Today, I once again have the honor of introducing a man who really, truly needs no introduction. If you have lived through the last 50 years and enjoyed sports, great journalism, incisive commentary on the world of sports and society, or have listened to NPR, watched HBO, frequented bookstores, or even casually thumbed through various magazines such as Sports Illustrated, Newsweek, or Vanity Fair, among others, you had to have run across Frank DeFord, or you know what? You have not been living. <laughs> I will dispense with the listing of positions held, awards won, or noting the 20 plus books written by Frank over the years because he would have no time for him uh, to speak or to listen to our Frank DeFord lecturer for this year. I'm sure Frank would rather have it that way anyway. In fact, in a wonderful memoir he wrote, he said, I'm quoting you, Frank, ready? I have always believed that ideally your memoir should be filled with anecdotes about other more attractive people so that you might improve on the necessarily duller parts of the narrative, i.e. yourself. <laughs> so let's just take him at his word and follow his advice and just consider Frank DeFord for one minute. For all of us who have read or listened to Frank DeFord, we know there's a certain beauty and rhythm to his words. They engulf us and caress us like ebbs and flows of cascading waves on a tropical beach. But best of all, there is always, always a beautiful sunset when we are on his beach. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the beach, and let's welcome Frank DeFord. Thank you, Michael, for that very lyrical introduction. I'm very appreciative, and it's a delight to be back. This is our sixth annual lecture, uh, and uh, we've never had a more distinguished uh, speaker than we have today, um, Taylor Branch. Uh, Taylor, I, I was uh, looking at, at your memoir, your resume, and I figured there were three things that we share. Uh, number one, Baltimore. I grew up in Baltimore and left, and Taylor then came to Baltimore where he lives now, meaning the only artistic uh, uh, constant is John Waters. <laughs> He's there forever. Um, both of us, oddly enough, have been ghostwriters for Bill Russell. I wrote just an article. Taylor wrote an entire book with Bill, who's one of the more fascinating people uh, in sports, and I know he's been here as well. Finally, uh, we have both been critics of the NCAA. I, um, I sniped at him for years uh, on a regular basis, but I was just sort of a little terrier, just snipping at their, at their pants leg. Taylor went out and he dug and he researched and he did something that no good full-time sports writer had had the sense to do, which was really to report on what the NCAA is and more important, what it isn't. <clears throat> he took a bite out of their private parts, is what he did, which is a big difference of what I've been doing, just sniping at the, at the pants leg. When his article appeared in the Atlantic uh, three years ago, I used my NPR commentary to call it the single most important sports article ever written, and I was absolutely right. Everything that has happened since then with respect to college athletics can be traced back to the criticism and the good reporting was found in that extraordinary article. All of a sudden, all of us insiders uh, discovered the NCAA and wanted to know more about what lay under the surface. And it was simply Mr. Branch and his classic devoted journalism 
that brought that about. Don't ever think for a minute, any of you, that the written word can still be a powerful instrument for revelation, for change, and ultimately for good. That article proves it all by itself. But his career, of course, has, has embraced the larger world, especially his monumental work on the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King in particular, as well as his collaboration with, with Bill Clinton. I will not go into the many, many awards he has won, just to cite uh, perhaps the, the highest echelon, a Pulitzer, a MacArthur Genius Award, and he won a medal uh, for the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, which was presented by the President himself. So we are so honored to have him as our speaker this afternoon. He graces us with his presence and enlightens us with his wisdom. Let us all listen very carefully to Taylor Branch. hesitate to get up here after that. Um, uh, I did understand the hashtag, McGar2015. I know enough about Twitter to do that, but I hope you won't tweet that I took a bite of the NCAA's private parts. <laughs> That's a, a fascinating uh, description. This is not my speech, by the way. This is an NCAA legal brief. Um, <laughs> that I may or may not get to mention uh, later on. I don't b believe in that. This is uh, quite weighty. Uh, I want to thank the University of Texas and Dr. Kramer, Mike Kramer, for having me here. Uh, it's, I am honored to deliver a lecture named for Frank DeFord uh, in his honor about sports journalism. But I want to try to talk about journalism and sports journalism in tandem uh, because I'm, I'm basically a tourist in the sports journalism business. Uh, Frank, is a, Frank is a pioneer. He's a, he's a legend in sports journalism. He says in his own, by his own description that all you need to be is to be a mediocre plus athlete yourself <laughs> with plenty of dreams and the identification with the frustrations of sports, uh, passion, and then a great gift for words. Uh, which he has in, in, in music. Well, I didn't have that. I came into journalism by a twist of fate, and I have bumped into sports journalism four times uh, by accident. So for those of you who are trying to fashion a career in any kind of journalism in, in this difficult and changing institutional environment, um, a, a very brief sketch of how I stumbled into this area might be instructive to you. I grew up in Atlanta the son of a dry cleaner pl planning to become a surgeon. And it never occurred to me to be a writer at all, or to, particularly to write about politics. Um, but as fate would have it, the civil rights movement intervened. I was in the first grade the year of the Brown decision. I graduated from college the year Dr. King was killed. All through my formative years in between, the civil rights movement relentlessly battered against my fear and desperate attempt to avoid it. Don't let people kid you. People were scared of the civil rights movement, black and white, uh, up until the end. But it went on so long that um, I, it was the witness of school children, particularly the little girls that marched in Birmingham on, in the 1st of May into dogs and fire hoses that stupefied me because I had just told my parents my mom particularly, that um, this had been going on so long and was raising so many deep issues of, of patriotism and, and even religious belief that when I got really old and an established surgeon at maybe 30, um, <laughs> that I was gonna try to do something about segregation and just then I saw these little girls marching and they weren't waiting till they were 30 and they were singing the same songs I was singing and, Sunday school and marching right into dogs and fire hoses. And it really did break down the emotional resistance 
uh, that most people had around the country, everybody knew there was something wrong in civil rights, but until that moment, they said, well, it's somebody else's problem. Somebody should do something about it. We should elect another president. After that, people said, I should do something about it. So I wanted to know where this had come from, and by the time I got to college, I dropped my pre-med courses and, um, and wanted to know where a movement had come from that changed the direction of my life's interests against my will. And I went into journalism because I couldn't find a career to do that from, and journalism was where I thought I could, I could uh, perch and observe things in politics until I became a grown-up and selected a real profession, which I never really did. Um, so I went into journalism and kept telling my magazine editors and magazines that I wanted to write books. And when I finally started writing, wanted to write books, they said, I, where are your credentials? I didn't have any. Um, and they said, well, the best way for you to break into book writing if you want to write a book. I said, I want to write a book. I want to write the narrative history of the civil rights movement. And they said, nobody buys books about race. But if you want to write books at all, you've got to get into, you got to break into the business some way. And in those days, one of the best ways was as a ghostwriter. So um, I got a contract to write a book with John Dean, who was a lawyer in Watergate. And I went and lived with, his, with him for a year. Ghost wrote a book named Blind Ambition. It was really a ghost. Uh, it came out, it did well, so I got a lot of offers. And I said, well, gosh, I'm backing into a writing career. Um, what's a real writer? A real writer is a novelist, not a nonfiction writer. This is, this is that little, the little itch of literary pride had hold of me briefly. I said, I want to become a real writer. That's a novelist. And ghostwriting is good practice to be a novelist because when you're a ghostwriter, you write a whole book in the vocabulary and in the mind of another character. And I've done John Dean, so the best practice to be a novelist, if that's the way they say I have to break into the book business so that I can write about where the civil rights movement came from, um, let me pick the character most different from Dean. So I picked Bill Russell. And, <laughs> went and lived with him for a year in Seattle, where he still lives. I just talked to him last night. He's still around and doing great. But we, did, we had a rocky road. He, Russell is a Cracker Barrel philosopher. He really wants to be Will Rogers of our era, and he would be, it would have been, uh, had he been white. He kept signing contracts after he, after he left the Boston Celtics with 11 championships in 13 years. Uh, in which the networks promised to let him do regular interviews, non-sports interviews, and he would pay for lessons about interviewing techniques. But they never did that, and he wanted to write this book about establishing an identity out of sports. But when I arrived, he clearly didn't trust me. He thought I was coming in there to write a book about his overall philosophy of life, but that I was conspiring secretly with the publisher just to write about him and Wilt Chamberlain in the locker room. That's, <laughs> that's what he was afraid they wanted. So he wouldn't talk to me, he was a little gruff, and finally in desperation, because I had a book contract, I went down to Oakland, where Mr. Charlie lived, his father, because I knew, I could tell, he always talked about his father. Uh, I spent a week with Mr. Charlie, and drafted the first chapter of the autobiography of Bill Russell with information from Mr. Charlie, all of it was from him, in the vocabulary of Bill Russell from his point of view. And I gave it to him, and he read it, and he says, okay, now we can start working together, but the first thing you're gonna have to do is to put a golf, put a tape recorder in my golf cart, because I play golf every day, and I'm willing to talk to you, but only on the golf cart. So we drove around in the golf cart and wrote that book. Um, I went back, so that was two ghost-written books. I said, now I'm ready to write a novel, so I wrote a novel, and it sold about 500 copies. Uh, and I said I better get back into nonfiction, wrote a few more nonfiction books because publishers still wouldn't give me a contract to write about the civil rights movement. Then finally they did. They gave me a contract three times longer than any contract I'd ever had. It was for three years to write the whole history, narrative history of the civil rights movement, storytelling without analysis. I said analysis doesn't get you there. Wherever you're most uncomfortable, you need personal stories 
to, for discovery, not abstractions. And race relations, all the abstractions like militant and liberal and racist and all that sort of thing are so much airplanes flying over reality, you need personal stories. So I'm writing this long, it ultimately took 24 years. Well, they didn't give me a contract for 24 years. They gave me a contract for three years. What that meant was that I was running out of money all the time and I had a small family, so I was having to write things on the side to pay the rent um, before I could turn in another chapter of, of King. And the first one was on, they told me to go down to Georgia. He said, you're from Georgia. This was Inside Sports, I think, was the magazine. They asked me to do a profile of Jan Kemp in the 1980s. And not many people here probably know her. She was a remedial English instructor at the University of Georgia. Um, who was fired by the University of Georgia because she refused to change, she specialized in athletes. And she said that a number of Georgia's athletes were functionally illiterate and she worked with them really hard but she couldn't give them passing grades and they changed the grades anyway to keep them eligible. Um, and when she protested that, they fired her and she became the most vilified person in the state of Georgia because she was endangering the eligibility of people like Dominique Wilkins. <coughs> And the provost of the university in the lawsuit is quoted as telling her, who do you think is more important to this university, you or Dominique Wilkins? Um, sh she was in big trouble. <laughs> that provost also testified in the trial that what we are doing for these athletes is, aside from giving them a wonderful opportunity to be here at the University of Georgia, we are making it possible for some of them to have a career in the post office instead of on the garbage truck. This was testimony. It was pretty rank and um, tough in the 80s, and I saw all this. Jan Cook tried to commit suicide twice. Um, she was a remarkable lady, and I sp her quote was, all over the country, college athletes are used to produce revenue. I've seen what happens when the lights dim and the crowd fades. She was really writing about what was going on behind the scenes. I did this profile and went back to Martin Luther King. Um, ran out of money again a few years later and Inside Sports said, Eddie Murray, there in your town of uh, Baltimore, may be about to sign the first $3 million sports contract in the history of professional sports and is notoriously um, a, a standoffish to the press. He won't talk to reporters. And since you write about race relations and he's black and we don't have any black reporters, would you try to go do a profile of Eddie Murray? So I went to talk to Eddie Murray and for some reason on the experience of Mr. Charlie and Bill Russell, I asked him about his mother. That was my first question. Um, to make a long story short, Eddie Murray is a wonderful guy. He talks like crazy. His teammates loved him. And the next thing I know, I'm flying on the plane with the Orioles because he wanted me to go on road trips with him. Uh, and that got me my first experience in, a, and really my only experience extended in locker rooms, where as a sports journalist, you might be interested to know, this. maybe this has changed now, but my overwhelming impression, this is from 30 years ago, is that all the position players were sculpted athletes in the locker room. They had tremendous physiques, and now they're even more amazing. But the pitchers, in stark contrast, s several of them wore actual girdles. Uh, <laughs> they were sunken chest and, and they didn't look like athletes at all. And I didn't understand this sharp difference between one group of players and the other. But I did love Eddie Murray and I shelved that in sports journalism and, 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 and went back. Spent 24 years doing my life's work on the, on the civil rights era. Uh, and when it was over, I went down to some friends at the Atlantic and said, all my books turn into tomes. Uh, I'm not naturally a hermit. I want to write something uh, on a more modest scale. And they asked me for a bunch of ideas, and I told them I wanted to write about Indian tribes and casinos or, you know, a whole bunch of things. And they said, fine, is there anything else? And I said, well, as a, as a semi-sports fan all my life, I've always wondered why the NCAA is in perpetual scandal and never seems to do anything about it. And they said, well, why don't you write that? That would be a surprise for your readers and for our readers. The Atlantic doesn't usually write much about sports. And I said, yes, but I don't know anything. 
about the NCAA, and they said, all the better, approach it like a historical subject anew and tell us what you find out. Why are we the only country in the world that plays big time commercialized sports at institutions of higher learning? How did that come about? So I, um, I went to work and really stepped in it with, my, um, with a capsule history of college sports in the United States. Um, suffice it to say the NCAA does not like me. Um, <laughs> we have had lots of troubles and if you ask any questions about it, I'll be happy to talk about it. But essentially what this makes me is to some degree an accidental sports journalist really qualified to discuss the basics. And to me, the basics of sports journalism always start with your cliches and your, and your, and your myths. Um, because sports is such a, uh, has such a, occupies such an amazing space in the world. My wife always grills me on sports cliches. And it brings me up to the limits of my knowledge. She, for example, keeps telling, asking me, what is a downhill runner? How do you have a downhill runner on a level field? Um, this is something that's invented by sports journalists uh, somehow to mean uh, something about go running so forcefully ahead that you look like you're going downhill is the best I could explain it to her. <laughs> then she said, why do you need a vertical passing game? And I said, well, as best I understand that a vertical passing game is that you want to get the ball way down the field. You want to have a deep passing game. They call it a vertical passing game. She says, well, that sounds like it's really a horizontal passing game. If you want to go a, far, a long way down the field, if you want a vertical passing game, you'd throw it straight up in the air. Um, so I got kind of lost on that. Um, then she said, why, why do so many sports journalists, particularly when they're talking to coaches, say that they want to pick the coach's brain? Um, this really hit home with me because I've seen it a lot in political journalism too. I confess I've done it myself and in more recent years when I'm getting interviewed people are always saying as though they're doing me a favor that they'd like to pick my brain. And I just, I, I occasionally say, what image of my brain do you have? Um, is it living? Um, is it like a nose? Uh, is, it, is it a carcass? Um, wh why do you think that's flattering? And, and, and somehow it comes into sports journalism and, and, and should go away. Um, I've settled that with Christy. We've agreed uh, pick your brain should be banished from all journalism, but particularly sports journalism. It's, it's incredibly common um, when people are asking for interviews. But finally, um, there's a whole category of cliches in sports journalism that have to do with war that have to do with mounting your attack with teams that develop the killer instinct, teams that draw the first blood. And um, I did develop a, a great interest in, in that, not necessarily as something objectionable, because it raised for me, it re reminded me of my times on Bill Russell's golf cart when he would start spinning like Will Rogers about the nature of sport and say that Every sport is some mixture of art and war. Uh, it's a blend. It's its own unique blend. But you have to have elements of both or it collapses. And he would say it, it collapses without the war and the war images and the competition. He said even those cute little female gymnasts, don't kid yourself, they'll cut your heart out uh, to win. And even the most blood-flecked, Boxer, for that sport to work, it has to have elements of art, supremely like Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The reason that sports has such a, an enormous hold over us is that it's an artificial universe in which we combine art and war in small packages that stop short of death, that capture some of the drama of war and, and some of the beauty of art in, in little packages that test character and, and that produce daily dramas of agony and defeat and all the standard um, sports cliches that way. And um, 
in that sense, the important thing for sports journalists to, to realize there is that you are talking about something that's important. It is uh, a, a basic part of human drama is in this competition and what it reveals in character. But it is also a, an artificial universe that's created for precisely these effects without having to kill lots of people. <laughs> um, in fact, to some degree, it substitutes for real war psychologically in the, in the country. But w what, what this means for us is that the, the sports, war, and art suspension of belief that you have depends on rules to make it fair. That's why sports people are so nuts if, about a wrong call. Because the whole notion of this is that, is that sports are supposed to be ruthlessly honest. That's how they advance the cause of integration in an era when, when race relations resisted everything else. You're here in Texas. It was unbelievably resistant. Probably not many of you know that Texas had the last all-white college football championship, national championship team. And, um, and that was six years after the passage of the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. Can you imagine an all-white, 90-something players, not a single black player? Um, because those rules managed to suspend and evade the honesty that true, top, true competition encourages. So the rules and what, what the, the environment of sports tells you requires thought and honesty and fairness. And it, and it is applied to a field that is artificial for which people want not to think. They want to cheer and boo. So that's the conflict. People want to cheer and boo, but you're writing about something that is a serious part of national life that needs to be fair and that relates to other aspects of life and that to understand its relationships to other aspects of life, you have to think clearly. And um, in that sense, I, I'd like to suggest for sports journalism, there, there are some minor, minor um, mysteries that still plague me about sports journalism. One has to do with the, the name, the nickname of the, the Washington team in the National Football League, uh, and how long it has survived, and how many people chirp the name, which I won't mention. Um, and frame the issue of whether or not this is a just system or whether or not this is, uh, should be changed, they frame the discussion and many articles about that around the question of whether or not it may be offensive to Native Americans and Indians. And if it's not, if they can find an Indian that says it's not offensive, uh, then they think that settles the question. Uh, whereas it seems to me that a moment's thought would tell you uh, that, that having this name is, is offensive to everyone, um, uh, particularly in the nation's capital uh, that's devoted to and built on a constitution whose first three words are we the people. Th that to have something like this is, is an embarrassment. And to me, it's a challenge in sports journalism. A, a less threatening myth, perhaps, but also about the sensitive issues where fairness does not intrude in an artificial universe that is really built for fairness to teach us these lessons uh, about life um, is from history. And a lot of you may not even know anything about this, but for nine years from 1967 until 1976, the NCAA, my NCAA, um, <laughs> banned the dunk shot in college sports. You could not dunk from 1967 for nine seasons. That required the NCAA to define the dunk, which I really commend to you. It's, it goes on for a page and a half uh, about the, an imaginary cylinder that goes straight up and what can and cannot be inserted into that cylinder at the same time the ball is there. Um, the rule also goes on to say that not only can you not dunk in the game, and if you do, it's a technical foul and the other team shoots free throws, but that you can't dunk during warm-ups, which required the referees to, to show up at the game early 
And if, the, if one team or the other dunked, then the game started with technical free throws by the other team. <laughs> Theoretically, by both teams would shoot free throws uh, according to how many uh, people dunked. But this lasted, the, the anti-dunking ban and the mystery about it is what is the cause and what was the process by which it was instituted. It was announced the day after the Final Four in 1967 when UCLA beat the, uh, Houston. Um, some people said it was because the Houston team with Elvin Hayes and a bunch of those people had a dunking jamboree during the warm-ups and that all the NCAA people were there and they were offended by it. The common myth is that it, it was because of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who was then about to have his senior year at UCLA and was dunking all the time. Uh, Kareem says that the rule was against him, but then, of course, it lasted for eight years after he left and went out into the pros, and that's pretty hard, hard to figure. Uh, an alternative explanation, which I got from a lot of people in the history of the NCAA, is that it was because of the Texas Western victory over Kentucky in the 1966 National Championship game in which five black starters uh, from Texas Western beat five white starters under Adolph Rupp at the University of Kentucky, and that, and that Rupp turned red every time the Texas Western team dunked. And he didn't like the fact that he was losing the national championship to an all-black team, and he really didn't like the fact that they were dunking because he said it showed a, a, an exuberance that was unfit for the sport. And he had a, <laughs> he had a number of he had a number of friends in the NCAA Rules Committee, and the next year they simply out, outlawed this exuberance on the part of black players who were then creeping into the sport. But it lasted for nine years, and this is in an NCAA that if you read all of, all of their pronouncements, they are devoted solely to, to the benefit of the athletes who play. Um, they have no uh, financial goals, they have nothing but the edification and, and the development of these players. And the only thing they could say about it was that a lot of people might get injured in, in dunking uh, and that it took away from the, 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 the skill inherent in the game. Um, but that's a historical question. I want to bring things up to the, to the present. Uh, with myths that are unattended to or to some degree unconsciously passed on in sports journalism to paralyze uh, the level of thinking that I think sports really needs to have um, on campuses. Um, when, I, um, when I agreed to do the history of college sports, the first thing I, for the Atlantic, the first thing I did was to go to Chapel Hill and see my old president, Bill Friday, who's now since died, he was president of the University of North Carolina when I was there back in the 60s, and he stayed for a long time and became the head of the Knight Commission about reforming college sports. And he said, Taylor, please take on this assignment. Go figure it out. I want you, he said, I want you to take the university and, and take it back from ESPN and the NCAA and give it to Socrates, where it belongs. Um, in other words, get all this um, obsession with sports off the campus and go back to making it a place of intellectual rigor. And um, I did to some degree, but I ultimately had to go back to him and say, uh, Dr. Friday, there's a lot wrong in the NCAA and there's a lot wrong with schools, but a lot of it is because the academic sides of colleges are not thinking clearly. They're, they are so imbued with their sense that they are a paternal benevolence to the students that they can't think clearly about the roles that are being uh, done here. And I don't want to force any college to pay anybody. You think that that would make it only more corrupt and take it farther from Socrates. But uh, I do think that universities have to think clearly enough about the roles of sports and academics and how they fit together that they can understand that, that, they, are that they are depriving people of basic elemental rights here that prevent them from even framing the question accurately whether big time commercialized sports and the university's mission of Socrates and clear thinking and free thinking on difficult questions can coexist 
and how to make them coexist. And right now, they're pretending that they're the same thing. And they're not the same thing. And it's easy to see that they're not the same thing, but people want to embrace convenience to avoid thinking about that rather than thinking about the difficult questions. And there are three myths that um, sports writers today, sports journalists, regularly perpetrate and, or, or at least seldom question uh, that I would like you to at least begin to think about before you write about any of these issues because they are gonna, they're going to fester and they're going to become more and more important, the relationship between the commercialized sports and the university's academic mission. One is that the universities can't afford to give athletes bargaining rights because no universities make money. Texas is this classic ex uh, exception that your athletic department here actually is, quote, in the black, whatever that means. The, the notion is that, that universities can't afford to change the rules because they're already stretched. This is, this is a, a moment's thought will tell you that this is a myth. They're not, the, the athletic departments are not profit-making um, institutions. Their job is not, they, they don't have shareholders. Their job is not to deliver a profit, especially at a state university. They're a nonprofit, but what their main job is is to spend all the revenue that's coming in, and that revenue is going up. It's gone up steadily right through every recession and everything else. Sports are healthy. Sports will stay healthy. The question is, how are they organized and what's their relationship uh, to the university? Um, when you say that, you know, that athletic departments can't afford to change their relationship or potentially pay the revenue athletes, what you're really meaning is it will disturb the convenience of the allocations that have already been made on the basis of, uh, of appropriating all the money that is generated by the revenue athletes and giving it to coaches and lavish facilities and so on and so forth. Yes, things will have to be made. That's called business decisions to, to, to address and be fair and to be smart and efficient about the allocation of resources between those who generate them and those who benefit from them. All universities do this. They do it now. The English department doesn't generate as much money as the business department, and both of them probably generate more money than the classics department. So the university is involved in a countless number of decisions about that do not ignore the revenue generating potential of various departments in the university, but blend them together for the overall use of the university. But the athletic department makes plenty of money not to have to artificially rob people. Myth number two, only one or two percent of college athletes are going to go pro. That's an NCAA advertising campaign. Therefore, the unspoken premise is, therefore, they should all forget about making any money while they're in college because they're not going to become professionals anyway. Um, and this seems to go down well with people unless you're a college athlete. And that to them, well, first of all, they all think, even the second string punter thinks they're going to go pro because they're allowed to live in a fantasy world in which they get no realistic feedback about what their, what their prospects are uh, while they're in school because nobody is really bargaining with them over what their potential might be. But they all, in other words, under the current rules where nobody can be paid, they're all paid equally, so the second string punter thinks I'm getting just as much as, as the Heisman Trophy winner. Um, and so therefore I can go. But what they, what they really think is I have been doing this sport, this basketball, this football, since I was six years old, 80 hours a week, it's the only thing I'm good at, and now they're telling me that if I don't have a chance to go pro, and I'm generating all the money that I can see around here, I'm part of what's generating it, that I should forget about that because I'm not going to go pro. I should forfeit the only opportunity I'll ever have to realize to reap a nest egg out of the talent and the effort that I put into it. That's like saying you don't have a realistic prospect of having a great retirement. Uh, you're not going to live long enough. Therefore, you don't, shouldn't worry about what you make as your salary during your career. Long-term prospects have nothing to do with that. The fact that only 1% or 2% go pro has nothing to do with the, how you allocate the funds that are generated while people are in college. And it all rests on the third myth. I don't even use this 
phrase. But if you use the phrase student athlete often, you are repeating the mantra that the, that the NCAA uses constantly to blend the functions of student and athlete <coughs> in a way that allows convenience to trump thought and, and, and any due regard to the rights of the athletes. How does that happen? Well, most people in the United States play many roles. You're a doctor. You're a deacon. You're, you're also a mom. Uh, you can be a board member. You can be all of these roles. And we function well in a society because we keep them straight and you do them one at a time. Many students have different roles too. They're, they're of course brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, but they also have jobs. Of 20 million college students in the United States, roughly 14 million of you have part or full-time jobs outside the classroom but we don't call you student investors or student bookstore cashiers. Uh, we don't call James Franco a student act actor when he's making millions of dollars uh, acting in films while he's a student at Yale. And we don't say that Mark Zuckerberg is a student entrepreneur when he's inventing Facebook uh, at Harvard. And we certainly don't say we're confiscating all the money that you earn uh, those 14 million people earn because you should be students first and that means that we have a claim on the money that you're generating outside. Only with student athletes do we say that it's a hybrid function that's pretty hard to understand and really social, solely under the jurisdiction of the NCAA. And I tell you what happens then. The temptation is to get it backwards. We treat college athletes as athletes in the classroom where you have professors who don't want them in the classroom and who sneer at the NCAA as anti-intellectual and say I don't want jocks in my classroom and that's just, a, that's just a matter for the athletic department and I don't want anything to do with it thereby ignoring their central role that when that student is in the classroom the professor is responsible for making sure that that is a real student and even outside the classroom, the professor as a citizen of the university is responsible for whether the academic um, part of that student's career, separate from the athletic one, is, is treated with integrity. And often it doesn't. I can tell you the saddest moment I had after this article came out was at a Big Ten university uh, in an audience like this, I was talking about treating students as students when they're outside their sport and the editor of the campus newspaper stood up and said, we never write, we never have written a story since I've been here about any athlete on this campus as anything other than an athlete. And he said, the reason is because the students don't consider the athletes fellow students. They're like entertainers. They're like circus people. We might get their autograph and we might be nervous to get their autograph, but we really don't think of them as real students and to some degree, uh, the professors don't either. But the other way around this where the athletes get the worst of both worlds is they're, if they're treated as athletes in the classroom, they're treated as students on the field where they're told, we have your best welfare at heart and it would exploit you, which is literally what the NCAA rule book says, that it would exploit college players to allow them to come into contact with commercial interests who might be offering them money or making a deal with them for a cut of what they get on the uh, jerseys that are sold with their name on the back of them. That it would exploit them if they are exposed to commercial interests, which is almost, almost vintage Alice in Wonderland turning the word exploit upside down. It would exploit you if somebody can give you money rather than if somebody takes value from you and doesn't give you money, which is the ordinary meaning of the word exploit. Therefore, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you say the phrase student athlete, you forestall the clarity that comes when you separate these two roles and begin to address the question of whether, a, of whether an honest commercialized sports relationship that can be as non-commercial as the swim team in a lot of places and as commercialized as the football team in a lot of places. 
whether it can coexist with an academic, a rigorous academic standard in which those people are also students. If college players, if universities were somehow to reconcile these two things and say, okay, we're gonna address them, the faculty, everybody, there are students in the classroom, there are athletes there, what are the fair rules in both areas that uphold the best tradition of fairness in sports and clarity of thought at the university of its, itself, if they do that, the, the athletes who manage both of those careers would be due, and I think that they would reap an enormous amount of respect beyond what they receive now because they will be managing two very, very difficult careers at once. And they deserve the right to represent themselves in determining how those two careers should be managed, what the schedule of classes should be, how, how am I gonna do this, how am I gonna manage the practice in the sports. Right now, they have no representation whatsoever. They have no rights. If you look at the Penn State scandal, the bottom line of the Penn State scandal is that the athletes could not raise any doubts or any alarms that they had, and I'm not saying a lot of them had them, but if they did, they could lose their scholarship. They would have no recourse. They couldn't, they couldn't protest whatsoever. The report that the FBI director put out said that some of the incidents that went on of sexual abuse that went on were so blatant that some of the janitors in the locker rooms were quivering and had to be comforted, saying that they saw things that shook them up worse than being, since they'd been in the Korean War. You're in a locker room and this doesn't get around, that this kind of stuff is going on, but nobody says anything because all the power in college sports is concentrated in the athletic department, the coaches, and the administration. That's what, those are the ones that were, that were indicted, and some of them are facing criminal trial right now. But when the NCAA got hold of this, the penalties that came down didn't say there should be fewer, fewer, fewer jobs in the office of the coach or in the office of the athletic director or any of the other pe adults that they identified as complicit in the cover-up of this scandal over decades during which um, sexual abuse went on. They said scholarships should be reduced for future athletes who were in high school and didn't have anything to do with it. So it just goes to show you that the NCAA professes to have the interest of kids at heart, um, but it won't withstand scrutiny. This is the, um, uh, uh, this is not my speech. This is the legal brief. It was just filed two weeks ago by the NCAA in a motion for summary judgment against the suit at my alma mater, North Carolina, brought on behalf of former athletes, where it has now come out and been established that over 3,000 non-existent paper classes were created over 20 years to, give, to keep athletes eligible, and they were totally fake classes. So a lawsuit has been brought, and I may have to testify, and I, I, I don't want to, uh, but I, I will if I have to, uh, and it, it, it's being brought by the same people who brought the O'Bannon case for anybody that's interested in that, in which I did testify. So um, um, in response, the NCAA just filed their answer, and what it says is the, the gravamen of the suit is that the NCAA, the athletes, the ex-athletes on behalf of th some 3,000 ex-athletes that were given totally fake courses, I mean where they didn't even see a professor, um, and where the grade was made up and often adjusted to whatever they needed to keep them eligible. The suit is on their behalf as a class saying that they were defrauded out of the, 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 the contract that they had when they went to the school, that they would be getting a bona fide education, and that the NCAA is party to this because the NCAA sets eligibility rules and regulates academic eligibility and calls it, an, uh, 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 um, that's part of its function. So their answer basically is legal cases compel the conclusion that the NCAA did not assume a duty to ensure the quality of education student athletes received at member institutions or to protect student athletes from the independent voluntary act of those institutions or their employees. 
The plaintiff alleges that the NCAA has long held itself out as the guardian of college athletes' education and economic opportunities and thereby expressly and implicitly assume certain duties to student athletes it is vowed to protect. But this does not change the above analysis or separately create a legal duty to plaintiffs because they do not demonstrate an intent to create a direct legal obligations between the NCAA and the plaintiffs, meaning the athlete. What the NCAA is saying here, when it comes down to it, they want authority over the athletes, but they have no responsibility for the athletes in, in, in academics because athletes are not members of the NCAA. They have no vote. The NCAA has no contractual relationship with them. It's only with the athletic conferences and with the, with the members. And when it comes down to it, that's what we find out, and I think that it's all too common and something that we should investigate and think about in our society, not just in sports. We profess to do so many things for our children. Uh, so many of our laws and public policies are adopted on, on, uh, on an understandable notion that we have to protect our children who can't protect themselves. But if you really examine those policies, often, uh, often the adults protect themselves more than the children. And that shouldn't be occurring at institutions of higher learning where there should be a clarity of thought that will adjust, that allows us to adjust principles to convenience rather than convenience to principles and the rights of the students. So that myth is under attack. Uh, I think it is rightfully so. I think that it will help universities to become healthy, to think about it, and to be liberated from the myth of the student athlete which has allowed a dangerous amount of theft and a dangerous amount of, of, uh, of amateurish um, predatory thought. So um, that's not a, um, that's not a myth, uh, wishy-washy position, I know, uh, but I'd be happy to answer questions about the student journalism or any other thing uh, that you have now. And I wanna um, close by saying again, it's an <coughs> honor to be here with and in a lecture with Frank DeFord and in a lecture in his name because people think sports are fun, but sports can also be profound, and I think he showed that. Thank you. Questions, we're going to bring this around. Uh, so anyone, raise your hand. Why don't we start right in the front with Taylor. Taylor, in Division I college athletics, more and more, particularly we see this in football, there's the haves and the have-nots. Those in the major conferences who participate in the championship series and like the University of Texas have massive revenues. I live in Dallas where SMU plays in a minor conference, doesn't make near the money. So if we implement a program to pay, for example, football players. Presumably, University of Texas has more money to pay players than SMU does. And so the disparity between the haves and the have-nots would seem to me to be, would appear to grow. So, so what is your approach for paying athletes in a way that would not exacerbate that problem? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that it is a problem. Um, because it would only be a problem if you wanted to adopt something that all college, all 1,100 colleges uh, played on the same level field in the same kinds of facilities and paid their coaches all the same. That, the, 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 the playing field is not even now. Just look at the salaries of the coaches and the facilities where people train. Um, my proposal is not to, is not to establish a plan for paying anybody. My proposal is simply to acknowledge that the rules that collude to restrict athletes so that they can't even talk to a lawyer about their rights or their mother can't even get a Christmas card from a sports agent, that all those rules are bogus, that they are potentially criminal restraints of trade and would be so regarded if they were directed against adults and just say abolish them and see what evolves with the universities free to make decisions except that they can't combine with all their potential competitors to rig the market. So 
competition would. Students would bargain for longer time to complete their degrees. They may bar. They they would have. Uh, uh, representatives for students would proliferate. Uh, they would be bargaining for a salary above their scholarship. They'd be bargaining for all those things. And the system would evolve, and my guess is that, that w what would evolve would be a tiered system of conferences, more or less like the minor leagues in baseball, uh, in which conferences agreed to compete at level, different levels of compensation, and that probably Texas would play in the Texas Hold'em unlimited <laughs> And they'd be playing Alabama and, and Ohio State and all these other schools in un, unlimited. And I don't know how it would evolve. My guess is that different schools and conferences would specialize in different sports, that they would develop strategies in trying to poach players of different skills um, because you can't, you can't pay everybody anything. But it is, um, it is not, I don't think you can devise a plan to impose, to limit, to, to, to limit people's, uh, that's the whole notion, unless you get an antitrust, it, you can't do that in any industry. And, 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 and therefore, what's going to happen is you're going to have layers, uh, layers of competition that, that will evolve, and that's not that m much different from what we already have. I mean, it's a, it's a fantasy to think that all of the schools compete at the same level. The reason the NCAA is splitting up right now, quite frankly, I've talked about issues of principle, but it's splitting up over money because the top five conferences have said, we're tired of all this Mickey Mouse about our, our, our players starving and, and then the NCAA coming in and making us ineligible. We want to pay them more. And the, and the poorer schools are saying we can't afford it and the big schools are saying tough luck. And, and when that, ha and Mark Emmert, I, I was testifying with him before the Congress last summer, and he said flat out, we are forced, we have to choose to go with the 65 schools, even though they're a tiny minority, because that's where the revenue comes from. That's where all their revenue comes from. You know, the NCAA gets all of its revenue from March Madness, or 90% of it. Uh, they don't get any from football anymore, um, because the big football schools sued to, uh, to break up the monopoly, and they won. So um, I don't think there is a plan that would satisfy everybody, and I think, frankly, um, people overcomplicate it by saying, um, uh, show me a plan that would minimize the convenience and maximize the justice of the system. My point is, start with removing what is clearly illegal, and one day may be considered um, tortious and libelous, that people in universities may have to answer, you voted every year to keep these restraints on trade that, that resulted in robbing this class of athletes of hundreds of millions of dollars. What is the principle on which you did that? Because um, it didn't happen by accident and it didn't happen under any law. You couldn't write a law, a state law, I don't know how many lawyers you have here. You couldn't write a law to dis, it's not just taking away their vote, it's taking away their, their, their whole right of representation from these athletes. It's a level of social control in the United States that is only seen in places like North Korea, what athletes can't do. You couldn't write a law to do that. And right now, universities do it by a very respectable collusion under the NCAA that is getting a, a, a bad name because it's coming apart over quarrels over the name and the notion that it's amateur is, is not doing well in public uh, because of all the money. The money's gotten so big that it's embarrassing. The NCAA, by the way, because of that, they're very skilled. They're skilled, skilled bureaucrats. They're like J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, they may not be well motivated, but they're really skillful. Um, <laughs> the, they change their model, their, their, they, kept, they keep student athlete. If you ever hear an NCAA official speak, they will use the phrase student athlete uh, at least once in every sentence. <laughs> but they, they used to use amateur. This is amateur. There's something pure about that. Uh, ignoring the fact that amateur is something you, a standard you adopt for yourself out of love, not something that you impose on somebody else that you don't allow to be a member of your organization. <laughs> but it was so obscene, the term amateur, in connection with the amounts of money that the athletes were being walled off from, that they officially chained, dropped the term amateur, and they adopted the, the, the term the collegiate model. 
So nowadays they talk about the collegiate model. Well, the collegiate model is just another word for a system that gives the athletes no say and no stake in, 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 in what they do. There's two microphones here. Um, in terms of North Carolina, I, I read the book Cheated recently, and Dean Smith in my lifetime has always been held up as a, not only an exemplary basketball coach, but a, a defender of civil rights and human rights. And But yet if he was complicit or even ignored what was going on academically at North Carolina all those years, it's real hard to balance who he was or what he was. He may have been a great basketball coach, but if he turned a blind eye to it, he was devaluing these black student athletes. And Roy Williams, who I have a personal dislike of, but still he, he says he doesn't want to be involved in academics and he takes a personal interest in not talking to faculty members because he doesn't want to be perceived as causing undue influence. But it's just like turning your, a blind eye to what's really going on. And I don't really know how to balance that in terms of North Carolina or even the NCAA in terms of what it really means? Um, well, those are very astute observations. They're very painful for me as a UNC grad who almost ghost wrote Dean Smith's memoirs. Um, uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, my freshman year, he was burned in effigy because he had lost so many games the year before. But by my senior year, he was in the Final Four uh, on his, on his I think the fair analysis of, of Dean Smith is that he was a gentleman. He was way ahead of his time in race relations uh, um, in North Carolina. Uh, he did try to get his athletes to graduate, and in that sense, that was good. But he, you're right, he was there for the early development of, of the paper classes, which, uh, and I don't know how many of the athletes specifically on his team were there, but they overlapped his year. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if a number of his players weren't getting um, the benefit of these fake classes. They were engineered by the academic um, counseling department. And at North Carolina, the athletic counseling department, uh, the academic counseling department for athletes reported to the athletic department. Uh, that is crossing the Rubicon of, there are two Rubicons in sports. One is who controls the grading system and the academic support system. If it's the athletic department, it's almost certain that their, their, their job is to keep these people eligible. Um, if they report to the provost, then it's at least a game. A lot of places they don't. If you're interested in, in ethics in college sports, the, one of the first questions you should ask is uh, who, who controls the academic support um, staff, which is, are, are vast, uh, for the athletes. The other question is, how much variance is allowed at admissions for athletes, and how many athletes um, are, are allowed that? I think uh, the coach at Arizona just turned down a job at Marigan, Maryland because Maryland refused to give him unlimited special admits, meaning, <laughs> meaning that he didn't have to have any um, academic qualifications for any of his players. And the athletic director turned him down. But those negotiations go on, and, and they're real, and they are uh, Rubicons about how, how the world of commercialized sports intersects uh, with a, a world that's supposed to be about the integrity of learning and, and, and thinking. Roy, uh, I don't know Roy Williams, but as far as I can tell, he's been catatonic uh, about this. I, I think he has taken advantage of this. To say you don't want to know anything about the athletics about the academics when, when you have academic support counselors who report to the basketball coaches, not necessarily to him. Most of these things are you know, done by the assistant coaches. The assistant coaches are the ones that wake players up at six in the morning and take them to the weight room. Um, there's a, uh, but I can tell you this, Roy is suffering, right? he can't recruit. People won't go to Carolina because this scandal is hanging over them. Uh, and it's going to have a tremendous effect on, on one of the great basketball programs in the, in the country. So it's, it's definitely coming home to roost, even at a university, or maybe especially at a university that had so prided itself on, on having a balance of integrity that was epitomized by, by Dean Smith. Question over here. Yes, sir. 
first off, thanks for being here. If you had a, a white coat and a stethoscope, you'd be more distinguished looking than oh. most surgeons that I've ever met. <laughs> the, the question you sort of brought up of how did we get here in the first place of sports and universities being tied together. And, and the same thing, especially in Texas, is sports and high schools. It, it mm -hmm. corrupts on the way down. Is there any model in other countries, I guess, for soccer is, is the biggest sport of, of how to have farm teams and how to have sports leading up to the big leagues uh, that don't involve schools? Well, most countries in the world are, are organized on the model of club sports, particularly soccer in Europe. Um, and some of the club players might be going to university, but they're not, uh, they're not on university teams and the universities don't sponsor them. Um, here's, you know, a lot of the sports that we play were invented in the United States, like football, um, between the Civil War and World War I, and, and, they, and they originated on college campuses. And, and so that really, um, that to some degree accounts for the origin and the placement of how they evolved there. Ironically, in, you know, in the Ivy League, uh, the Ivy League was, was really the incubator for, um, for college sports uh, at a time when the athletes themselves controlled the sports. Uh, for the 19th century, they, they coached themselves or sometimes they hired themselves and the university didn't have anything to do with them. They scheduled their own games, they collected the revenue. Uh, Harvard, which was a pioneer in all of the, especially football, uh, along with Yale, Harvard didn't have a coach until 1905. Um, and the university didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there are lots of, it's really an interesting history. I had a lot of fun writing about it, but it's uniquely American in that not only is it developing when Europe in that last, latter half of the 19th century, when Europe is busy colonizing the world, <laughs> we didn't have any colonies, but our kids were playing football and showing that they could be tough. They played football with no helmets. I mean, uh, you were considered a sissy if you wore a helmet. At Princeton, Frank's alma mater, um, in, in the, uh, before the World War I, they developed something known as the chrysanthemum haircut, where they would grow their hair long and then twirl it into chrysanthemums that they'd put on either side and they would give them a little protection. Uh, but they'd never dream of wearing what were then called moleskin head harnesses um, instead of a helmet because that was considered sissy. In fact, in the early days, the forward pass was considered sissy, you know, because you didn't, ha you didn't have to run through any blood and guts to make a, make a yard, you know, it was, it was airborne. Uh, the, the history of these sports is really interesting, but it was incubated on college campuses uh, more or less by historical accident and then, and then grew up there. And faculty control, let alone university control, didn't develop until the 20s or 30s, um, taking it away from students. And then the revenue, of course, didn't really start to any, for any serious purpose, any large purpose. Uh, until the television era uh, in 1950s when Walter Byers really constructed the power and the revenue stream for, for the modern era of college sports. Taylor over there. Um, yeah, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a journalism student and you were talking a lot about where the convenience for the university just sort of ruins it for the athletes and ruins it for the rest of the school. And so UT has been working on a deal with Silver Star um, the Cowboys merchandising sort of company, and they're supposed to be entering into a 10-year monopoly deal. And I was just wondering if you had any sort of comment on where that fits into like the convenience, but then also still allowing a university to function as a school. Well, who's, who's, whose jerseys would they be selling? They would be making basically any apparel that had the Longhorn logo on it. So, I mean, it would, it would just be any sort of apparel. Uh-huh. Well, I think if it, if it's just got a Longhorn logo on there, that's the property of the University of Texas, and that's the history of the University of Texas. And I would think they could make any any deal. I don't know about trademark law and commercial law and stuff like that. But if they're putting the name of your star player on the back and people are buying it because of the name of the star player, then any deal that prevents that player from negotiating a cut of it is unjust. And in any other field of law, uh, w would be would be rule so, um, but right now you know AJ Green 
was suspended for a bunch of games because he sold his own jersey. Um, so players now have no stake in anything that they do. You know, the O'Bannon case um, was about right, you know, the NCAA requires you to sign away the rights to your likeness and image in perpetuity. That was their argument. Uh, it was by ex-players, including Bill Russell. He was a plaintiff in the O'Bannon case, saying, when I played at the University of San Francisco in, 19, in the 1950s and signed this agreement, I didn't realize that the NCAA is going to be selling games and films of me in it long after I've left and saying that I have no cut to it because I, I agreed to be a perpetual amateur. That was ruled a violation of antitrust and that the, that the athletes do have at least some stake in the use of their names and likenesses, not only in games and, and, and films, but also in the sale of, uh, of uh, paraphernalia that, that, that makes use of their names, that people are buying because of who the players are. But the, the, the judge used the phrase student athlete 200 and something times uh, in her opinion, saying that it was that it was a violation, and you could tell that she didn't really want to do it. And she said, "Well, um, they deserve a stake in this, but it should be limited to five thousand dollars a year, and it should be set aside so that they don't get it until they graduate from college." That's because she's so inhibited by the notion that that they have to be just students, and that they they can't make a commercial bargain uh, as adults. Um, in sports uh, while they're still students because the NCAA says if they can do that, if they can bargain, then they are not students first. And anything that allows them any bargaining rights means that they're not students first and we, the NCAA, are here to guarantee that for their own, for their own good so that they can taste the blessings of the collegiate model, which used to be amateurism. Taylor, you may be interested to know that here at the University of Texas, the Longhorn logo, you know the, the yes. logo, is owned by the athletic department. The rest of the university can't use it. Really? Right. Uh-oh. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't no. know that. There's Somebody your, asked if there are any other questions on something any, nice and positive. <laughs> um, any uh, Please don't other get questions? the opinion that I don't like sports. I love sports. I just think people, people, um, tend to believe what they want to believe without really thinking and that the athletes are penalized for it. Yeah, I, I yes, have sir. a question. So are you essentially saying that the NCAA says that they don't have a duty to the student, it's the university that does? So does, does that lawsuit then, they're basically saying go after University of North Carolina for what your grievance is? Wouldn't they be able to, well, I don't know law, but the class is all athletes across all these universities, the conspiracy is more than limited to North Carolina. Well, the, the, the lawsuit was filed only on the behalf of the class of Carolina graduates who took these courses. It could, in theory, uh, be a larger suit for students at, uh, at lots of universities, but no. Basically, they're just suing, um, they're suing Carolina and the NCAA for breach of contractual obligations to deliver education and saying the NCAA says that we are about the academic integrity and they enforce these rules and they require eligibility, therefore they're liable. Uh, and the NCAA is saying, no, 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 we don't have any real contractual obligation to any student. Uh, your, your beef is with the university. So they're basically trying to opt out. Uh, Taylor, we're going to lose students, as you see, going to either classes or to get themselves fed before dining halls close. So uh, I think that'll do it. And uh, uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very for much being. for coming.